to discern means to recognize it means to understand it means to be rightly aligned that the lord jesus christ came with a physical body and he also has a spiritual body and the physical body has a lot of correlation with the spiritual body so we need to understand what the body of jesus was and then what the body of christ is god prepared a body for jesus jesus body was a human body all right a physical human body all right but it was also special it was special because it did not contain sin the sin that was passed on to man from adam that sin did not get to jesus God specially prepared a body that will make sure that you will not inherit the Adamic nature. My faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul rests Father, we thank you this morning for this privilege you've given us to come and listen to your word even as your word is coming with great power and might we pray that father you help us to open our hearts to receive your word let your word fall on our hearts as a seed and let the seed grow and bear fruits that will bring glory to your name we thank you in jesus name Amen. amen hallelujah you may be seated. You are welcome to church. I want to welcome grandpa and grandma. Amen. Amen. We thank God for their lives. Amen. Today is 7th October 2017. And um, I'm speaking on what I call discerning the Lord's body. You know, we've been looking at a series of um, teachings, you know, we started by looking at mind, your spirit, and we also looked at mind, your tongue. Then last week we talked about mind, your body. But today we are talking about discerning the Lord's body, which actually can also, you can also um, put it this way, mind the body. Last week was mind your body, but this week is mind the body. And I'm talking about discerning the Lord's body. Now, let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 30. Uh, sorry, chapter 11, verse 30. Yeah. It says, He was talking about the communion, the communion, and uh, he said something, you know, um, he said, for anyone, 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have also died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. Now, this is something that is very important and very critical and crucial and we have to understand and we have to know because um, if in the Bible it brought death, you know, it brought premature death, they didn't discern the Lord's body so they died prematurely, then it means that it's something that is worthy of note and we have to um, look at it critically and apply it to our lives. Now, the Lord's body that he was talking about here was the body of Christ. And that's the focus of the message today, that we should discern the Lord's body. When we say discern, to discern means to recognize. It means to understand. It means to be rightly aligned. To discern the Lord's body, it means to recognize, to understand, to be rightly aligned. That is, that is, that is um, what the Bible means by discern. Discern. And we, I want to start off by looking at the physical body of the Lord. You know, the, the Lord Jesus Christ came with a physical body, and he also has a spiritual body. And the physical body has a lot of correlation with the spiritual body. So we need to understand 
what the body of Jesus was and then what the body of Christ is. The body of Jesus was prepared for him was prepared for him and uh, it's also a picture and a pattern for the spiritual body the spiritual body of christ the body that we are talking about is a pattern and also um a picture of the spiritual body come to hebrews 10 verse 5 hebrews 10 verse 5 dealing with the physical body of the lord hebrews 10 verse 5 dealing with the physical body of the lord Hebrews 10 verse 5. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have no desire, but a body you have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the school of the book. He said when Christ came, he said that a body you have prepared for me. Jesus was the one talking, you know, according to this uh, scripture, that he said when he came into the world, he said a body God had prepared for him. God prepared a body for Jesus. God prepared a body for Jesus. The body that God prepared for Jesus was a special body. It was a special body. And we have to uh, take a look at how uh, or why God even gave him that body. Jesus' body was a human body, all right, a physical human body, all right, but it was, it was also special. And I'm going to show you why it was a special body. It was special because it did not contain sin. The body of Jesus did not contain sin. The sin that was passed onto man from Adam, that sin did not get to Jesus. God specially prepared a body that will make sure that he will not inherit the Adamic nature. Because you know that the blood, the blood in our bodies, that blood carries the life. In Leviticus 17, 11 says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so the same blood that was in Adam, according to Acts 17, verse 26, it said, of one blood, God made all human beings. So that same blood was the same blood that was being transferred from generation to generation. But God made sure that Jesus would escape that blood. Otherwise, his blood couldn't have saved us from our sins. When Adam sinned, Adam was a house who carried all humanity. So Adam sinned and it affected everybody. The Bible says, through one man, sin came and then all sinned. Adam was like a house and he contained generations. All of us were in Adam. You know, anybody who will be born physically into this world was in Adam. You see, so when he's saying the blood was contaminated, man had, had fallen from, 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 from dominion, falling from grace. And it was necessary that God restored man. You see, God didn't want to uh, do away with man and create another being. So God said that I'm going to restore man. And if God wants to restore man, God must go through a certain process where he will get another man Another man because dominion was already given to man. So it would take another man to take back the authority Adam gave to Satan from Satan. But this man also must not be contaminated because contaminated man cannot save contaminated man. So that was the problem that God had to fix in the Garden of Eden. For the first time, something God loved and something God hated were in one body. God loved man and he still loves man. But God hated sin and he still hates sin. He hated the sin nature of the devil, but that was in, in, in Adam. So a man with a perfect blood, free from contamination, you will not get such a man in this world. Because everybody came out of Adam. And because of that, everybody was contaminated and so nobody qualified. Nobody qualified to be the perfect man that will stand between God and man and that will be used to redeem man. So, God said, the solution really is that I have to become a man and save man. I have to produce a man out of myself and I will produce him in such a way that he will be a man with a legal legal permit to enter the world and to exercise dominion at the same time you have the perfect blood to save his fellow men from sin 
and that is why Jesus came. You see, the Bible says in Romans, uh, Romans 5.12 that um, Adam sinned and it opened the door, you know, for sin to enter the world and all of us also sinned. All of us also were contaminated. We also began to sin. And then he said, therefore, just as, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You know, then Romans 3.23 the Bible says, um, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all mankind, all humanity. So another man cannot save another man. No human being qualified. And that's why God had to come himself, you know, had to produce a man. He had to produce a man. The only solution was that divinity had to come into humanity. To take humanity and bring him into divinity. That was the only solution. Because no human being was qualified to redeem man because of the sin nature that we had inherited from Adam. You know, so God said something in Genesis 3.15. He said, the seed of the woman. He said, the solution to the problem that he was, that, 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 that was created by Adam's sin. He said, and I will put enmity between the, seed, the woman, you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She, he, she shall, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He said, the one that will defeat the devil, you see, bruise your head means he will crush his authority, the head stamp authority. So the one that will crush Satan's authority, the serpent's authority, was not the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman. Now the reason was that God wanted to bypass the blood of Adam and produce a man that will have the body of a man that's giving him authority on this earth, but will also not have the sin of a man. Because if God had produced something, somebody from Adam, he would have been like Abel, who was righteous, but and yet still his sin, his blood could not be the perfect blood to redeem mankind. So God said, it's going to be the seed of the woman. The, that person is going to come from a woman alone, no man. No man will be responsible for that baby. It will be a woman, a woman. Because you see, the, the thing is passed on from man to man. The man carries the genes, the generations, it's carried by the man. So that's why even in the line that God was creating for the Messiah, you will see that God was more particular about the man. You know, other people came to join. Some women came to join, but the line was not still corrupted. It was from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah, you know, even to David. Bathsheba came, time without a line, but the line was still preserved. Even in Judah, incest, you know, Tamar, he committed incest with Tamar, but the line was still preserved. Boaz came, and Ruth came from Moab, Moab to connect to the line. The line was still preserved. Um, Rehab the prostitute came from Canaan, Jericho, to connect to the line of Jesus, but the line was still preserved. Why? Because it is the man that carries the seed. The man that carries the seed. So, if God wants a man that can redeem mankind, that man should not be produced by a human, a human being. Not be produced by a man. Otherwise, he will still carry the, the seed or the nature of the devil in his blood. So God made sure that the seed was placed in the womb of a woman and God himself placed the seed in the womb of Mary. That's why Jesus didn't have an earthly father. If he had been born by Joseph and Mary, his blood wouldn't have been better than the blood of Abel because he would still carry the sin of man. So God bypassed the natural process and God is a wise God. When you study science, science will tell you that when the baby is in the womb of the mother, the blood and the baby, they don't mix. The blood of the mother and the baby do not mix. Because if, if Jesus, his blood had mixed with Mary's blood, we will still say that he was contaminated. Because he came from Adam, you know, the blood Mary also came from Adam. But God only needed a woman's womb because the only legal way to enter the world is through the womb of a woman. 
That's what gives you legal authority and right as a human being to exercise dominion or to operate on this earth. And so God wanted to get that legal authority at the same time also to get that blood without blemish. So the only answer was the virgin birth. That is why the virgin birth remains a cardinal belief in Christianity. Anybody who doubts it, God is against that person. He said, anybody who who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that he was born by a virgin, he was born by only a woman, there was no man involved, Joseph was not involved. That baby that was in Mary's womb was the seed that God promised in Genesis 3, 15. And the seed had gone through a lot of process and the seed had now become, you know, ready and Gabriel was sent to give the seed to Mary. And Mary opened her heart and received the seed and she took seed. When she said, behold, I'm the Lord's handmaiden. Let it be done unto me according to your word. She took the seed and Jesus was born. So we had Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is now with us. God has now reproduced himself as man. God is now one of us. It is a mystery. The Bible says great is the mystery of godliness. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. How God was able to process himself into man so that he will provide the perfect blood to save man. That's why the body of Jesus was not an ordinary body. It was, it was a special body that was prepared for him. It was a human body. All right, human body, perfectly human body, 100% man, 100% God. But the body he did, not, did not contain that natural life that was passed from Adam to us. Come to uh, Romans 8, 3. If you understand the body, the physical body, then we can understand the spiritual body. Romans 8, 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Look at the scripture. God sent Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh. He did not say Jesus came with sinful flesh. God sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh. Let me give you a clear example. In Numbers 21 verse 9, God told Moses, when the people of Israel rebelled against God, then and God, God sent serpents, fiery serpents, to come and buy them. Then the people were dying. Then God told Moses, in Numbers 29, to make a bronze serpent and set it on the pole. So he said, so Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he will look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, the bronze serpent, let me ask you a question. Did the bronze serpent contain the poison of a serpent? Did it contain the, the life of a serpent? No. The bronze serpent was just a picture of a serpent without the poison of a serpent. And Jesus Christ said in John 3, 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Which means that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. When you see him, you see him as human being. You see him as man. But he did not contain the sin of man. There was no sin in Jesus. He had the perfect human body that was capable of, you know, that, 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 felt, that could feel hunger. He felt hunger. He felt tiredness. He felt sleepy. You remember he slept in the boat. There was a time that he was tired. He told the disciples, come here and rest. He was a human being. He ate. He ate, you know. He did everything human beings do. And yet, the body did not contain the flesh, the sin of man. That is how his human body could carry the divine nature. He carried the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 9 says, In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Because his body did not contain sin. Our body, sometimes we can't even stand under the anointing. 
because of the weakness of our bodies. Sometimes even under the anointing, we can't stand. We can't bear the full weight of God. But Jesus Christ, because his body was sinless, he had the full weight of God in him. He carried the divinity. So Jesus was God, come manifested in the flesh to bring divinity into humanity and then from there, take man into God. That's the whole picture. Take man into God. When he came, he, he came as man. You will see him as man. And last week I said that without a body, you, are, you don't have a legal permit on this earth. Even spirits, spirits don't have a right to preach on this earth. That's why um, demons always want to live in people. So if you meet a spirit, you can command the spirit to get out because it is illegal for a spirit to be operating on this earth without a body. That is why demons always want a body to live in. Even if it's a body of a pig, they prefer that one to be hovering about because without bodies, they are ineffective. They cannot make any impact. So the body of Jesus gave him full authority and right to operate as man. Remember when Satan said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. He said, man shall not. He said, look, Satan, I am man. I have a right to be here. So I have a right to face you boot for boot and take back what you stole from man. Man shall not live by man. He said, man shall not. He said, don't put me at a certain level. I am man. He was 100% man, 100% God. But he never used his powers as God. He stripped himself of his powers as God. So he had to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Acts 10.38 The reason why Jesus Christ was anointed was because he stripped himself of everything that he, he never used his powers as God to heal the sick. He healed the sick as a man anointed by the Holy Ghost. That's why he said you too can heal the sick. All the miracles he did he did them as man anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, the works I do shall you do. And even greater works. Hello? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm building to a point, so follow me. So Jesus Christ came and he died. He died and resurrected. Now, the resurrection of Jesus' body is also a pattern for our body. That our bodies too will be resurrected. In fact, when he was resurrected, it was the same body that he died in, that was resurrected, but it was glorified. The body was glorified. It's the same body, but the body was glorified. That's why that's, 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 that's a, 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 an assurance to us that a time will come when God is going to resurrect our bodies. Resurrection is different from being raised from the dead. When you are resurrected, you come with a new body, a glorified body. Like Jesus, when he died and resurrected, he came with a physical body. Come to Luke 24. People sometimes say that when Jesus rose from the dead, he was a spirit. He was not a spirit. He was a human body, but he was in a glorified body. Not limited by time and space, like our bodies are. Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. You see? And when he has said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it before them. That was the glorified body. That's why the body that we are going to have when Jesus comes, that body can eat. Jesus' body that he was erected, his body could eat. His body could eat. Luke 24, verse 36. It is Luke 24, verse 36 to 43 that I read. Luke 24, 36 to 43. 
He said, give me a piece of fish. Let me eat. Meanwhile, his body was a glorified body. Do you know that he did not come through the door? He, they, they were guarded and they had locked the door, but he stood in their midst. And yes, too, he was flesh and bones. Is that not amazing? I mean, he didn't come through the door, so you would say that he is a spirit. And yes, too, he was flesh and bones. Th- that body did not contain blood, it was, was flesh and bones. And that's the same body that we will have when Christ comes. In many scriptures, like Romans 8 23, Philippians 3 20 to 21. 1 John 3, 1 to 3, I can't read all. In these scriptures, the Bible makes us understand that we are going to receive a body just like Jesus' glorious body. Let me read Philippians 3, 20, 20, 21. That is, that is an assurance that a time will come. This body of ours, now this body is mortal. The word mortal means subjected to death, death due. This body can die. But the time will come, the bodies we are going to receive, it is going to be glorious. It cannot die. It cannot, it cannot be subject to pain or to time or limited by space. Philippians 3, 20, 21. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. He will trans- transform He will transform our lowly body. This body is lowly. It's, it, it doesn't have glory. You see, but he will transform that body into his glorious body. So if Jesus rose from the dead and he could eat fish, it means that the body we will have too can eat. The body we will have after resurrection can disappear and appear at, at will. You wouldn't need any transportation. You could just, because you are not limited by time and space. He just appeared in their midst like that. And yet, so he was flesh and bones. Now, so you know why he was flesh and bones? The blood was shed for us. So he said, I have flesh and bones. The body was flesh and bones. When we read Ephesians 5:30, he said, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So, the spiritual body of Jesus. Now, I've thought about the physical body of Jesus. You've seen that it's a special body. It's not a body that is like any other. That's why, that's why um, they couldn't have killed him. No matter how they tried to beat him and try to they couldn't have killed him. He himself, when he wanted to die, that was when he died. Because that body did not contain sin. Even Pilate said, I find no cause of death in this man. That was a testament to the fact that there was no sin because sin is what brings death. He said, I find no cause of death in this man. If you, if you watch the Passion of the Christ, you will see that, you see how they beat him. Even that one is not a true reflection of what the Bible says. I mean, it's not, it's not an, an exact picture, you know. But that one is closer than most of the Jesus films I've watched. They beat him. I mean, they made sure they really beat him. But he never died. You, they couldn't have killed him. So he got to a point where he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he left the body. Otherwise, nobody, he said, no one can take my life. I have commanded to lay it down and I lay it down because of my father and I will take it again. Nobody could have killed Jesus. Even though they try, you know, sometimes they, they will try and, you know, say, I want, want, want to push him off the cliff. They, they couldn't kill him. Even Herod wanted to kill him when he was a baby. He couldn't have done it. He couldn't. Yeah. Because the body was not a human body. It was not an ordinary body. It was a human body, not ordinary now, when you look into the Bible in the Acts of the Apostles, you see the emergence of the church. But when you get to the epistles, you will hear the phrase, the body of Christ. And Paul even calls it a mystery. That a mystery was hidden from people in ages past, but now has been revealed to him, Paul, and the holy prophets. And said, that mystery is Christ. 
The mystery of God is Christ. The mystery of Christ is his body. There are only two mysteries in the New Testament. The mystery of God, which is Christ. That mystery was hidden in ages past. And God, God knew that he, he had to reveal that mystery at a certain season. Christ. So, he waited for that season and then he gave the revelation to Paul. So, Paul's core message was Christ. That mystery that God, God came and he reproduced himself as man. And because of that, you know, and the mystery of Christ is also the church, the body. That Jews and Gentiles coming together in one body, making one new man. That was also a mystery. These are the two mysteries in the Bible, in the New Testament. The mystery of God and the mystery of Christ. You know, I, I tell you that I don't like using the word mystery. But th these ones, they, they are words that are in the Bible, you, you can't run away from it. Now, the spiritual body of Christ, or let me say the body of Christ, is also like the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus refers to his physical body. The body of Christ is his spiritual body. That is you and I. You and I. We are the body of Christ. Adam was a reflection. You see, Adam was a picture of deeper realities, spiritual things. In fact, the Bible says Adam, even, even, the Bible even says that Adam was a figure of Christ. Adam was a figure. Of Christ, he was he was foreshadowing Christ. He was somebody who revealed who Christ will be. You know, uh, Romans five fourteen say Adam was a figure or a type of Christ. Now, just as Adam contained all humanity, Christ also contained all the chosen ones of God. So Adam is the head of the of the created race, the created race, the race that was created, okay, then Christ is the head of the begotten race, okay, Christ is the head of the begotten race or the chosen race. Do you know when God chose us in Christ? God chose us in Christ even before the foundation of this world. Come to Ephesians 1. Verse 4, if you understand this, it will change the way you think about the church, the way you think about believers. If you read 1 verse 4, even as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, okay, from verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ. Before the world was created. So, Adam actually was created to be a reflection of what God had done in the spirit long ago. That's why Adam also came as a body containing many, many human beings. Hello? So, Christ actually was conceived in eternity. And all of us were in Christ. God chose us before he created the world. He chose you before you ever existed. In Christ. Which means Christ is eternal. You see, Christ, when we say Jesus Christ, you see, Christ is eternal. Jesus gave Christ a human face. He was the one who gave Christ a human body. Human face. He was. He became Jesus the Christ, the Anointed. But God chose us in Him even before Adam was created. So everything Adam was going through was supposed to be a reflection of what Christ, what God had done in Christ, which was going to be manifested in due time. That is why Adam was placed in a garden, and God said, "Tend the garden and keep it." You see, then God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a help comparable to him. What did God do? God put Adam to sleep. When he put Adam to sleep, 
Then he removed Eve from Adam. He took a part of Adam and created Eve out of Adam. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that the woman came out of the man. Is that not the same thing that Christ went through? Jesus died, that his bride also, I mean, his body, we are the church, the church also, or the bride also came out of Christ. The same way God took, brought Adam's wife was the same way God brought Christ's wife. Why? Jesus is the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15 45. He's the last Adam. He's the, he's, he's the one that Adam represented. Adam was a type of Christ. He was the first Adam, and Jesus is the last Adam. So when Adam slept, then Eve was, took, was, was taken. When Christ also slept, when he went through the process of death, what he was doing was that he was going through that process to give birth to the church. So the church came out of Christ. The church came out of the very bowels of Christ. That's why Christ and the church, you can't separate the two. So anything that affects the church affects him directly. Directly. You can't separate the two. John 12, 24, it says, Except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So, the grain of wheat falls to the ground, then it dies. Then, after dying, then it produces many more grains. That is God's wisdom. So, Jesus Christ was the grain of wheat. In fact, he was talking about himself. So, he fell and died. Then, through death, which is also sleep, God produced many grains, which is the church. So the church is a product of Christ. We came out of him. We, the church is not an appendage to Christ. The Bible says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The, vine, the branch of the vine is not attached to the vine with tape and screws. The branch grows out of the vine naturally. It's an inseparable union. Jesus Christ gave birth to the church. Like Eve came out of Adam, we also came out of Christ. And so the church bears the DNA, the imprints, the very nature of Christ. Hello? Are you following? Yes. Yes. So we are the many grains of wheat that was produced from that one grain. And together, the one grain plus the many grains make one bread, one loaf of bread. That's why Paul said that the communion, the bread which we partake, we all partake of one bread. Why? Signifying that we are all one with Christ. I'm, 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 I'm going to show you why working in bitterness against a believer can cost your life. I'm going to show you that. Working in bitterness against a believer can cut short your life. I didn't say God will kill you. It, it can cut short your life. <laughs> okay. But don't be afraid. It's not, it's not dangerous. <laughs> it's not scary. Now, so... All of us come to 1 Corinthians 10, 17. We are getting there gradually. The body of Christ. They will know how to design the body. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. It says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Okay, from verse, from verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We, who are many, are one body, for we all partake of that one bread. So in the, in the early church, the communion they did, they took it from that one bread. That's why it was held in small groups, from house to house. 
So you will come and take a piece of that bread. What you are saying is that I belong to this body. I am just a part. I'm not the whole body. I'm just a part of this body. And I recognize that my brother or sister too is a part of this body. We are all one. So the Corinthians, when they had divisions among them, some of them started dying. After taking the communion, they started dying. Because the very thing you are taking, your divisive attitude is defeating the very purpose and meaning of the communion. That all of us belong to one bread. One grain of wheat, many grains, one loaf of bread. Then we partake of that one loaf of bread. Then we all eat. So you are just a part of the body. Hello? Yes. So, so that is, that is, so we come to Ephesians 5.13. Ephesians 5.13. The church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 5.13. Ephesians 5.13. The church is the body of Christ. Okay, from verse 29. For no one ever hates, hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Of his flesh and of his what? Do you have that in your Bible? Of his flesh and of his bones. We are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. And Adam told Eve, this is now the flesh of my flesh and the bone of my bones. So just as Eve came out of Adam, we also came out of Christ. In fact, the very place where God took Adam's rib, you know, and formed Eve, that, that, the very place that we came, when, when the, spear, the spear was thrust through his side, blood and water came. That was a picture that the last Adam too, something was happening to his side because the bride was also drawn from him. And we, we were born. And in actual fact, we were in Christ before Adam even came. That's why, uh, okay, I don't want to bore you, but you, <laughs> that's why you see Christ in types and shadows even in the Old Testament. Yeah. Even though he manifested, you know, he, he got a human face in the New Testament, in the Old, you still see Christ. Jesus said, Abraham desired to see me, and he saw me, and he was glad. And they said, you are not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> he didn't say I was, he said I am. God, God is I am. God is ever present. He's ever present. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That was when they picked up stones to stone him. Because he was treading on deeper waters. <laughs> they couldn't understand. <laughs> you remember in uh, Hebrews 11, 24, Paul said, Moses, when he was of age, refused to be called the son of first daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of Christ than the place of sin. Moses, suffering the reproaches of Christ. Christ where was Christ at that time? Do you understand? So Christ actually is eternal. And God was revealing him in snapshots in the Old Testament. In fact, the Bible says in first, you can write this scripture down. Hebrews 11, 24, 26. That's Moses. Then 1 Corinthians 10, 4. The Bible says, And they were all baptized unto Moses, and they all drank from the same spiritual rock, and that rock that followed them was Christ. So the rock that was following them in the Old Testament, he said that rock was Christ. God was just showing bits and pieces of Christ. But the fullness was shown by Jesus. And we are the body of Christ. Now, let's come to the body. The church is the body. Ephesians 1, 22. The church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22. Let me read from verse... Um, 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, 
not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the body. That's the picture God has given us. So when the Bible says that God will put all the enemies of Christ under his feet, where, where do you think the feet of Christ is? In the body, in the church. So we are his feet. We now give him a legal representation on earth. Because now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. We are representing him here on this earth. So without us, he does not have a representation on earth. So the church is not an organization. The church is the body, the legal representation of Christ on this earth. The embassy of heaven. So the church put together carries the anointing that was on Christ. That anointing, see, the word Christ means the anointed one. That word Nobody qualified for that word. That word was used for only one person. But when he was enlarged, and then we were brought out of him, we too became anointed. So 2 Corinthians 1.20, he that has called us and anointed us in Christ is God. Amen. So Christ is the head. Jesus is the head. We are the body. The Ephesians talks about the body, whilst Colossians talks about the head. So when you study Ephesians, try and study Colossians and Ephesians together, you see there are certain similarities. One is about the head, one is about the body. We are the body, the church. That's why we usually refer to Christ as Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. When, when you hear the word Christ, in scripture, a lot of times, it's, he's referring to the corporate Christ, Jesus and the church. God does not separate the two. That is why when you touch the church, you've touched him. So, so, why persecutest thou me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul might have been very surprised. Because he thought he was chasing Peter and co. Trying to kill Stephen and co. And Jesus says that you are persecuting me, Jesus. Why? Because anything that happens to the church, he takes it personally. He takes it personally. So if you fight the church, he will fight you. He said, if you destroy the temple of God, God will destroy you. He was talking about divisions in the church. Divisions in the church. Because collectively, corporately, we are the body of Christ. The body of Christ. The human body can be used to understand, you know, can help us understand the body. Even Paul used the human body in the Bible to explain the body of Christ. You know, come to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Okay, then verse 14, 12, 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Referring to the human body. Just as like we have different parts of the human body, in the body of Christ too, we have different parts. But all the different parts, they make one body. And all the different parts, they are all joined to the head. The brain. The brain oversees all the activities of the body, but there are different functions. Different functions. Even in your body, you have um, different systems. Respiratory system, reproductive system, nervous system, skeletal system, digestive system. What other systems? What other systems? What? Excretory system. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> Circulatory. Yeah. <laughs> and all these things are in the body. 
And the body is made up of many, many different parts. Last week, I, I, I read to you a research I conducted on the body. It's amazing how the, even science has not even fully grasped the complexity of the human body. The number of cells, tiny, tiny cells, millions of cells in the brain alone. Even in the brain alone, the head, there are over 200 and something bones in your head. That makes the score. So the body is not one member. It's not just the hand. When you see somebody, you look at the face. The face is not all there is to the body. The, all the other parts are also parts of the body. And that is how we must view the church. That the church is made up of many parts. When I say the church, I'm not talking about an organization or a place of meeting. I'm talking about the organism, the body of Christ. The believers, believers that have Christ in them put together is the church. And we have different functions, different members on the same body. Different. Verse 18. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18. But as it is, God has set the members in the body, each one of them, as it pleases him. Is that in your Bible? Is that in your Bible? As it is with the physical, so it is with the spiritual. God has set each member in the body as it pleased God, not as it pleased you. So the nose is at the place where it should be because God appointed the nose to be on the face and the toe to be in the shoe. So if we're a toe and you want to be seen, you'll be awkward. If we're a nose, you should be seen. Are you getting me? If we're a nose, you should be seen because God has set you in the body on the face. If you are a toe, you will always be hidden. That is how God has set you in the body. That's why it is absurd for you as a human being to even look at your physical body and, and downgrade your physical body and despise your body. It is absurd for you to look at somebody's nose and say, this person's nose is nicer than my nose. Or why is it that I didn't get this person's uh, 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 kind of face? Why is it absurd? Because God has set the members as it has pleased him. And Paul started by saying that he said, the, the hand cannot say, I don't need the legs. And the legs cannot say, I don't need the hand. In fact, he said, the head cannot say, I don't need the feet. Even Jesus he can't say that. He won't say that. That's not in the church. He'll never say that. For without him, we can do nothing. But without us, he will do nothing. He will never say, I, I don't need the church. Even he, Jesus, who is the head, he said, the head cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. So, the, the, the hand, the hand was created to be versatile. And that is the fashion of the hand. The hand can touch every part of the body. There are some people in the church, that's how they are. They are versatile. They can touch the nose, touch the, the mouth, touch the, the feet, touch the head, touch every part of the body. In fact, the apostles are hands. An apostle touch ev touches every part of the body. That's why apostles can activate all gifts in people. Apostles can impart. Apostles can train and raise. An apostle can raise a prophet, can raise an evangelist, can raise a pastor, because that is the duty. The neck is not versatile. The neck is stationary. The neck is at one place at one time. But it is absurd for the neck to envy the hand. Because the two are different. The hand can never be the neck and the neck can never be the hand. The same way in the human body, God has also done in the church. 
Every part, every member of the body of Christ is unique, has a unique function, has a unique gifting. That must bless the whole body. And by the way, when God puts you on the hand and you grow, you don't become a leg. If you are a hand and you grow, you don't become a leg. You become, you become a matured hand. Are you getting me? You become a matured hand. You become a bigger hand. You don't become a leg. Because God has set in the church. That's why there are systems in the body of Christ. We have the apostolic system, prophetic system. There are five systems. Apostolic system, prophetic system, evangelistic system, pastoral system, and teaching system. Apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral teaching. All the various giftings you have can be traced to one of these systems. You will either be apostolic or prophetic. You will either be evangelistic or teaching or pastoral. When you take the prophetic, there are many, 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 many members that make up the prophetic system with diverse functions. Some are seers, some are dreamers, some are people who, who, who receive inspiration. I mean, different, diff, different, different. So, you can be a prophet, you can be in the prophetic system, so this person can be in the same system, but the two of you, your manifestation will be different. You can be a singer, she can be a singer. You will never have two people who are doing the same thing, never. God is not short of ideas. God is very, 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 he, he's, he's, he's dynamic. Hello? So, there should be no competition in the body. If you know your place, you stay in your place, and that's how you affect the entire body. You affect the entire body when you locate your place and stay there and release the functioning in that place, then you touch the entire body. Different members, but the same spirit. It's like this. Let me give you this example. When you go to a kitchen, a modern kitchen, you will find appliances in the kitchen. What are some of the things you see in the kitchen? What? Blender, microwave, fridge, stove, oven, <laughs> what, what else? Kettle. Now, all these appliances, they are different. The blender can never do what the uh, toaster can do. If it tries, you will see the awkward, it's awkward. The fridge cannot do what the microwave can do. And the microwave too can't do what the fridge can do. But they are all empowered by electricity. So when the Holy Ghost comes in a place, in a, in a church, in a group, what he does is that he empowers everybody to bring up what God has deposited in you. So there's no room for copying and um, cloning. You can have many clones. You know a clone. God does not create clones. Everybody is an original. So if God puts me in your life to help you to grow, you will grow and become unique. And you will bring out something that will be a blessing to the whole body. It doesn't mean you must talk like I talk. Or maybe you must um, dress like I dress. Or use my mannerisms. No, you, if you copy, there's no, nothing wrong with that. But the essence of the thing is that you will come out with your uniqueness that will bless the entire body. It's a principle. So the electricity empowers all the appliances to function effectively. And when you go to the kitchen, you don't see quarreling and competition. Be, be, because each one knows that this is what I can do and I must do it faithfully. There's no need to stretch your neck and look at what somebody's doing. Say, oh wow, the oven is really hitting the thing. <laughs> <laughs> say, 
Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sad. I can't, I can't do heating like the oven. How can you? You are not an oven. You are a fridge. Yours is to cool things. It's very important that we treat the body. You see, that's why immaturity in the body. Look at baby Christian, what they do. Wow, look at Paul. Paul is more anointed than Apollos. Somebody say, no, 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 no. Peter is more anointed than Paul. Paul said, you are all babes. Because if you are mature, you will know that what Apollos can do, Paul can never do. What Paul can do, so when you compare Paul and Apollos, you are comparing oranges and bananas. Even though they are all fruits, they have different functions. God has set each member as it has pleased him. Sometimes look at somebody and say, ah, this person, look at this person, look at the gift that he carries. God has set him as it pleased him. It is God, it's not you. <laughs> Hello? So, designing the lost body. Now, okay, every member is also connected to the head directly. There is no member of the body that's not connected to the brain. The brain oversees all functions. So, you have a direct connection to the head. As much as I do. I don't have a better, um, let me put it this way. I don't have better or greater access to the head than you do because I'm a pastor. No. We all have equal access to the head. Every branch of the tree is attached to the vine. There are some times that God will connect you to certain people. Bible calls it a joint. Paul said the body grows by that which every joint supplies. A joint is like the wrist is joined to the hand. So this part is a joint. It will release something. That's the idea of local congregations. The reason I have local congregations is that God knows that I must connect you to this stream, this river, for you to bring out your uniqueness and to bear fruit. So he will take you to this river. Sometimes God can even take you from one local garden and put you in another local garden. Depend on the time and depend on the purpose. Sometimes he has finished working on you in this local garden and he takes you and puts you in some local garden for you to be worked on further. Sometimes too, he will even take you from there and take you to another place for you to be worked on further. But he's the same body. You don't live the body. You are still part of the body, but you are, you, you are, you are, you are joined to a, a certain part, an aspect. So a local church, like this church, is a local church. A local church is where God takes you because the body is universal, it's big. But God knows where you can grow and you can be nurtured and planted so that you can come out with your uniqueness. So God will take you and place you there. For supervision and encouragement and growth. So, what does it mean to design the lost body? The reason why they were dying. Get the message I preached called the love depth. Because I talked about one another and how God wants us to relate to, with one another. So I'm not going over that, but that's why I talked about the fact that we should comfort one another, care for one another, admonish one another, forgive one another, you know, honor one another. All in the in the Bible, the, the Apostle Paul taught us how to relate with one another. So get that message, the love depth, and listen to it. But not designing the body is causing schism, schism. <laughs> Schism. First Corinthians twelve, verse twenty-five. That word simply means division. But the New King James and the King James use that word schism. From verse twenty-four. Let me read from verse twenty-four. Okay, twenty-one to get the context. The eye cannot say to the hand, "I have no need of you," 
nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow, bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. You see, God has made it necessary for us, for us to relate. Because what he has given you, he didn't give me. So I need what you have, you need what I have. And so we must come together. And so that, that, that restores the body. That brings a sense of balance and responsibility in the body. Because you need me, I need you. A mango cannot eat its own fruit. A mango will need somebody to eat its fruit. So no matter how gifted you are, you can't be an island. When you become an island, you are on your way to death. When you are a lone ranger without connection to other believers, you can't survive. You, your, your growth will be stunted because there's something vital that must come from somebody to you. That's why I always say that don't underestimate even small group Bible discussion. There are many things you'll pick from Bible study that you can't get from the pulpit. Because the manner of God is sometimes hidden in his people. The manner is in his people. Somebody will come up with something you have not heard before, then he asks you what you know. That's an example. So division is not designing the Lord's body because the body is one. Any attempt you make to divide the body, you are not designing the Lord's body. And that can cause sickness and death. That's why the Corinthians were dying. That's how we eat the communion unworthily. It's when you are divisive or you are dividing the body and you still come and eat the same bread, the same drink. You are defeating the purpose and Jesus takes it personally. It's like taking a, a cutlass and cutting off his hand. The same way when Saul touched the church, he said, Oosh, Saul, you have touched me. When you touch a believer, Jesus will say, Oosh. If you pinch, a, that's why we must be careful when it comes to believers. Paul said to the outsiders, walk in wisdom. But to the believers, walk in love. Otherwise, we are not discerning the body. The reason for a lot of premature death in the church is because of this. Bitterness and unforgiveness toward believers. You see believers fighting. Paul said, how is a brother having a matter with a brother drags the person to court before the unbelievers and not before the saints? Division. First, uh, Romans 16, 17. Romans 16, 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them. The early writers, the early church, the apostles, they were very concerned about division. He said, anybody who caused division, avoid the person. What, what is division? Division is division, double vision. You see, for instance, every local house, every local house, you see, all of us belong to one general body. But every local house has a purpose. In Revelation, when Jesus Christ was sending John, he gave him a unique message to each church. Seven churches in the same general region, but seven different messages. 
So even though all of us are one body universally, every local house has a unique assignment, a unique mandate, a unique message. But put together, it is one body. So if God places you in a local house and you are not in tune with the spirit of the house, what you must do is to leave. The moment you cause division, you are fighting Christ. The only exception is when you see that the house, or let's say the doctrine, maybe they are erring in terms of doctrine. Maybe they are preaching wrong doctrine. But apart from that, if you are in this house, you must agree with the spirit of the house. You must agree with the direction of the house. You must not cause division. Otherwise, you are fighting against Christ. So Paul said, mark them and avoid them. He said, shun their company. 1 Corinthians 1.10 1 Corinthians 1.10 1 I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of, all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you will be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He said, there should be no divisions among you. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place with one accord. That is how God works. One place with one accord. One house, one vision. Not division, double vision, division. Jude verse 19. Jude verse 19. Let me read from 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. He said, they caused division. The early church, they, they fought division as they were fighting a cancer. Paul told Timothy, he said, I've put you here to check some people, not to say any other thing than what we are saying. He said, even if an angel comes from heaven to say something contrary to the gospel, let him be accursed. Hello? Philippians 2 2. Philippians 2 2. Okay, from verse 1. So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. That's the spirit that should govern the local church. One mind. One vision. If all of us are looking at one thing, we will be united. Right now, if I tell you that something is happening at the back, you will all turn and look the back. There will be some noise and some rattling but at the end of the day, you are going to see the same thing. So, God's solution to the division in the church is that let us all look at one thing. Then we can have fellowship. So, understand the language in the church. It's a language of love. In the time of the Tower of Babel, the Bible says, and the whole earth was of one speech. That's Genesis 11. But Genesis 10 verse 30, it says that there were languages in the earth, on the earth. There were languages on the earth. But the Bible says, and the whole earth was of one speech. We can have many languages 
but one speech. If we decide to walk in love, you may not agree with your brother or sister, but you still have one speech. Love. There may be disagreements, but one speech. It's like money. You can have various denominations, various currencies, but it's one speech. Legal tender for the purchase of goods and services. It doesn't change. When you go to America, money is used to buy. In China, it's used to buy by different currencies. Number two, not designing the body means causing hurt to the body. When you do that, you 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 are you are causing trouble. How do you cause hurt to the body? On sound doctrines. When you start preaching or teaching things that are contrary to sound doctrine, you are causing head to the body. You are not designing the body. You can incur the wrath of God. Because he takes it personally. He can take you off the scene. That's why I say you can cut short your life by that. Because you are destroying the temple and he will destroy you. 1 Timothy 1, 18 to, 9, 9, 18 to 20 and I'll end very soon. We are in the last days. <laughs> when Paul said the last days, it's 2,000 years now. When I said I'll end very soon. <laughs> First Timothy 1.18 This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage a good, the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenos and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They were teaching that, oh, there is no resurrection. It has taken place already. And Paul said, their teaching was corrupting people like cancer. And Paul said, because of that, I have handed them over to Satan. What will Satan do to them? Destroy the flesh. Afflict them with sickness. And destroy the flesh. Maybe causing premature death. So, we have to be very careful the things we come out with. He takes it personally. He takes it personally. So, the church of Corinth, they were doing all these things. Some were calling Jesus a curse. In 1 Corinthians 12, St. Paul said, nobody under the under the Holy Spirit will say Jesus Christ is a curse. They were saying that all in the name of spiritual gifts. And some of them started dying. Some also started getting sick. And Paul was concerned. Paul said, because of you are, you are not designing the Lord's body. You are not in right alignment with the body. Right thinking with the body. The third one. Not recognizing or accepting the authority of the body. The highest authority in the church is Christ. And the Christ is manifested in the body. So when you are going contrary to the body, you are not recognizing the authority of the body. And whatever the body decides, heaven has endorsed. Come to Matthew um, 18. 15 to 20. Matthew 18, 15 to 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If you refuse to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, even to the church, let him be to you as a gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loose in heaven. This scripture was not really about warfare. It's about a brother and a brother relationship. 
He said, if your brother sins against you, go to him. You go to the one who has sinned against you. It's not interesting. You are the one he has sinned against. But he says, go to him. And tell him his fault. If he accepts, fine. If he doesn't accept, he said, carry two or more people with you. If he doesn't accept, inform the church. If he despises the whole body, count him as an unbeliever. It's a serious thing. So, if you don't respect the body, if the church cannot discipline you, you are not designing the body. If you refuse discipline, if you are not submitted to authority in the church, it means you are not designing the Lord's body. He said, count him as an unbeliever. And he said, that decision, if you take it, heaven has endorsed. That, that's the meaning of whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. He was speaking in context. In that context, if the church decides that you are an unbeliever, heaven says, endorse. Heaven too will treat you as an unbeliever, even though you are a believer. Why? You have not respected the church. And Jesus takes it personally. You are not designed the Lord's body. Last but two, not accepting not accepting a particular grace or manifestation of Christ is you are not designing the Lord's body. I said there were five systems. As a believer, we should be able to accept all these five systems. Receive ministry from all these five systems. If you despise one gift and you don't respect it, you are what you are, or, or you stifle it. What you are doing is that you are causing hurt to the body. Let's say the hand, then you have tied the hand behind the back. The hand cannot move. If a part of the body decides to act independently of the brain, the stroke stroke, blood will not flow to that part. And so that part must be cut. And Jesus doesn't want to have an amputated hand. He doesn't want his hand to be amputated. So you rather will be taken off the scene. You will be taken off the scene. That's why we must, and by this, what I'm saying is that what I'm not talking about individuals. So, don't say that somebody came to you and the person said, I am this, so uh, listen to me. And I didn't listen to him, and so I'm in trouble. No, it's not like that. I'm talking about the systems. There are some local churches, they don't believe in the office of the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist. They don't believe in some of these offices. They, so they don't receive nourishment from these offices. It is not right. You are not in right alignment with the body. Because every one of these systems, they have something that they must add to the church. For the church to grow. Otherwise, you are causing stroke. You are condemning that part. Number four, bringing the image and the name of Christ into disrepute. You are not designing the body. When you drag the image of, of Christ into the mud, you are not designing the body. In that instance, God can retire you. Can say, Enough. You won't proceed further. Enough. You have hurt me long enough. Come home and rest. Let another take your place. Because you have disgraced the church long enough. Disgraced the church as in maybe you, you, are, you, are, you are like a, a symbol or let's say an example. 
in a church and you are doing something that is even despised by unbelievers, if it shakes the faith of other people, God can retire you. This one is not, it's not like God is good, it's not like God is judgmental. No. You see, the same way he retired Ananias and Sapphira. You know why he retired them? They opened the door for Mammon to come back to the church. It, it was a hurt because when the, the Holy Ghost came, Mammon's grip had been broken over the, the believers. That's why they were just giving like that. Some would sell their house and give the money at the apostles' feet. Would sell their land. Even, even Barnabas, who was a Levite, had a land and he sold it. Levites were not supposed to have lands. But he had a land and he sold it. Came and put the money at the apostles' feet. Then you, Ananias and Aphira, you went and stood there and said, okay, we have a land somewhere here. We are going to sell that land and bring all the money to the church. Then when you sold it, you kept part and you brought part. Then Peter said, when you sold it, was it not in your power? Why, why did you open your mouth to say that I will bring this to the church? And God had taken note of it. He has recorded it in, in his books. Added it to his budget. <laughs> and then you say, I've withheld it. Then Peter, Peter said, you have not lied to man. You have lied to the Holy Spirit. Then he was retired. God takes it personally. That was the first time somebody was killed in the church by God himself. Hey, don't tell me it's not God. It's God who did it. It's God. At least we know that for Sapphira, it's Peter who did it. But for Ananias, it's God. Whatever, that's why when God gives you something like a gift, and God says, release the gift to the church, don't withhold it. It can cost you. Don't withhold it. I'm not saying that God is going to kill you because um, you, 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 didn't, yeah, you didn't prophesy. Or, no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about disobedience. When you say, I won't do it. When you say, I won't do it. Maybe because of persecution, I won't do it. God says, preach. You say, oh, people are talking about preach. I won't preach. You say, okay. If you won't preach, then you are, you are not good to me. You are, you are, you are, to me, you are not useful. So, retire. Hello? It's a, it's, it's a serious thing. We need to start having this mind that God, when it comes to the body, Jesus takes it personally. He will, you will run into issues with him very soon if you, if you don't do, look at how you handle the body. You will run into issues with him easily. The last one. Not connected to the head. If you are not connected to the head, you can also be connected to the body. And so you are not rightly designing the body. Colossians 2.19, Paul talks about that. There are some people who are not connected to the head. The head, Jesus. They are not under the lordship of Jesus. See, the one we are all following is Jesus. Not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Look at the words, joints and ligaments. There are some joints. There are certain relationships God may bring you into in the church. And it's for a reason. Because iron sharpened iron. There are certain joints that God can create. When the Bible says that, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's not just talking about not, going, not coming for meetings. It's talking about this. Allow God to put you together, connect you to the believers. Because it's like, let's say the parts of a car, you are the door. You are the steer. 
you are the tie, you are the windscreen, and he's working on all. By the time comes where he must assemble all together. So he must connect the door to the car, the, the steer to the car, the windscreen to the car. And that one takes you developing that, that right relationship with the, with, the, with the body. Hello? So, when we have communion, and you are in the same church with somebody, and you are not talking to the person, don't come and eat. That is, that is, see, that is very, very dangerous. As far as that scripture is concerned, that is what will defeat, that is what will make you eat the Lord's body unworthily. Because you are coming, you are taking one part of the bread, I'm part of this body. Then another brother is coming, I'm also part of this body, but the two of you are not talking. That is not designing the Lord's body. It's very serious. If you have somebody you are not talking to, today go and tell the person, I'm sorry. Even if it's not your fault. One thing that we must be afraid of is bitterness and unforgiveness. If there is something that the believers can cost a believer his life, it is bitterness and unforgiveness. Because that one, it affects the spiritual body of Christ. Bible calls, Bible says it, is, it defiles the body. It defiles the whole body. And that's the reason why there are many deaths in the church. All these things. We are not designing the Lord's body. I want us to pray. We need grace to be able to be rightly aligned with the body. To be able to be rightly aligned with the body. To be able to have the right thinking concerning the body. Anything that concerns the body concerns Christ. He takes it personally. Let us pray for grace. That, oh God, give me grace. Grant me grace. Grant me the enablement. To have the right respect, estimation for the church. For my fellow believer. Open your mouth and begin to pray. Thank you, Lord. We ask for grace and mercy and help. Grace to walk in love towards our fellow believers. Grace to be rightly aligned with the body. Grace not to drag the name of Christ into disrepute. Grace not to cause divisions, not to cause hurt to the body. Grace to be connected to the head who is Christ. Help us, Lord. Grant us grace. Grant us grace. Grant us grace. Grant us grace. If, there, if there's any area where we have, we have fallen short, where we have not lived what in love toward the brethren, let's ask God to give us grace and to help us. Maybe there's somebody you are finding difficult to forgive. I'll talk about forgiveness maybe next three weeks. But there's somebody you are finding difficult to forgive. And that person is a Christian. Ask God. Let's ask God. Help us. Help me to forgive this person and to count him as a brother. In the name of Jesus. We are praying this second prayer. We are asking God to help us locate our uniqueness. Our uniqueness, our place in the body. And to find him as such. That God should help us to locate our place in the body. And to fashion anything that God wants us to do to ensure the growth of the body, we will not withhold it. What the current agenda of heaven now is the building of the body, the building of the church. 
That's the current agenda of heaven. Every gift that God will give you that comes from God will end up or result in edifying the church. That's why Paul said even prophecy is greater than tongues because prophecy edifies the church. Tongues edify yourself. And we want to be part of God's current agenda. The building of the body. In the name of Jesus. Let's be on our feet now. In the name of Jesus. Any gift that God has given us. We pray with God. Breathe, breathe, on, breathe on us. Breathe on us. Breathe on us. We will not withhold anything that we must release. Any gift. Anything you have done in us. Any gift that, that you, you need. In the body, we will release it. We will release it. Anything you put in us to ensure the growth of the body, we will do that. Anywhere you place us to contribute to the body, we will, we will, we will do that. We will be there and contribute. In the name of Jesus. Koriya talabahaza. Libran talamahadolosi. Mantalian talabahatalaba. Koriya talibahatalababasa. In the name of Jesus. There's a song which goes like this. It says, We are heirs of the Father. We are joint heirs with the Son. We are children of the kingdom. We are family. We are one. We are praying the last prayer. As usual, we are praying for Ghana. We are praying that, you know, the plan and purpose of God for Ghana will be realized. We are praying that every purpose of God, Ghana is on a certain path. And God is very much on course. But he wants the saints to always pray and release. So we are praying that every agenda of God, all that God has been doing in this nation is for a purpose. And that agenda must stand. We are also praying for the leaders, the president and the ministers. Any good plan they have for this country, God will, God should breathe on those plans. Any evil plan that will come into their heads, let those evil plans perish. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, Ghana will not die. Ghana will live. The purpose of God for Ghana will stand. The agenda of God for Ghana will stand. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our leaders. We pray for wisdom. We pray for our presidents. We pray for preservation, protection. In the name of Jesus, every good plan he has for this country, let it see the light of day. Let God breathe on them. Any evil plan, that the enemy will pump into their heads. We arrest those evil plans and we command it to perish. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you this afternoon. We give you praise. We pray that you will continue to be with us, continue to open our eyes so that we have the right estimation let us see things from your perspective. Let us handle the body with care, with love toward one another. Help us, O oh God, not to cause hurt to your body. For we know that if we touch the body, we have touched you, Jesus. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. <clears throat>